a little bit too long. Okay, I'm five seconds delayed already. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. My name is James McCaffrey. Let's see if I can pull up my slide. No, okay, I screwed it up already. There we go. Okay, there's the uh, little love for the uh, title slide, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, developing neural networks using Visual Studio. Well, I wish I could have had a snappier title, but that's what this is about, developing neural networks uh, using Visual Studio. Um, I work at Microsoft Research. I'm also the senior contributing editor at MSDN Magazine, uh, where I write occasional articles. Okay, so here's the agenda. Let it sink in for a second and tell me what's the one relevant uh, aspect of this agenda. Yeah, nine slides. Okay, no matter how bad it is, you'll only be tortured for nine slides. Um, <laughs> But we're going to try, and it's really kind of a cheat because some of the slides are, you know, animation, you know, like 23 animations, so. But <laughs> it should be relatively short, and I'd say where we're headed is slide eight, which is going to be a demo. And all the, pre the previous seven slides are going to be there to set up, you know, the demo. Now, my goal in this presentation is pretty lofty, I'd say. My goal is for you to be able to leave today having all the knowledge you need to know to successfully implement a non-trivial neural network using C Sharp and Visual Studio, okay? And that, in other words, you know, you'll be pointed to the resources and understand, you know, what you have to do. And that's not that easy. Now, how long have neural networks been around? A long time. One of the reasons why I've been doing this is that there's clearly a gap between research, the mathematician propeller heads, like me, because that's my background is mathematics, and the software development community. About three years ago, we did a survey at Microsoft Research, and it wasn't really a survey, it was an attempt to analyze existing implementations on the neural network that are available to the software development community. Okay, and things have changed, but not a whole lot. But three years ago, the single best reference was some guys, a teenager's from Bulgaria, his personal blog, okay, where he implemented in C++ or something like that. And it, was, it, it had many mistakes. So what happened was there's this, even though neural networks have been around for a long time, there's a real discontinuity. And my uh, goal in this thing is to bridge that gap in one, you know, 50-minute um, presentation. We'll see if it works or not. Okay, so the first thing is a slide, I, I don't know if I called this slide one or not, is it's important to understand what neural networks solve and what they don't. Um, this, and we'll take a look at it, and you know, you guys are pretty bright guys, I'm guessing, figure it out. When I say guys, I mean guys and gals and everything in between. So when I try to imagine, you know, we have a, it's intern season at Microsoft Research. We have PhDs from all over the country and the world coming in, and these are very bright people, but when they come to me with a machine learning question, really what it boils down to is they don't understand what problems are solvable at neural networks and what are not. So let's make sure we understand that. In this example, each, think about it as an Excel spreadsheet, because that's exactly what that is where each row represents, it's sometimes a fancily called a tuple, uh, a data thing. Now, in this particular example, we have the X data, which is, you know, the things on the left. Uh, age, income, uh, gender, a religion. Now, notice the religion here. By the way, this is just totally made up data. Presbyterian, Catholic, uh, and all others. Uh, and the politics. The goal of this is to predict the political affiliation. Now, would that be useful? I mean, is this a really useful example, or is this just, you know, nonsense dummy demo? Yeah, I mean, trying to predict the political affiliation could, you know, and when I say useful, I got to say, I'm sorry, I apologize to all my Microsoft research peers, but I believe money is a good thing. I believe that, you know, things that can drive predictions 
uh, like to predict the outcome of the Super Bowl or something like that, where there's a money outcome is good, and that doesn't necessarily, I'm not saying, you know, for the betterment of humanity, but I think if you've got a lot of money, you can do a lot of good. Um, now, in this, so for this particular example, which leads into the next slide, that um, down at the bottom, uh, one of my points here is that there is sadly, this problem is not new. This problem was or this type of problem was probably first seriously studied in the 1930s by statisticians, uh, in particular guys with the name of Fisher and Pearson and things like this. Um, but notice, okay, so there's one of the problems for anyone who's a software developer to understand this is the chaotic state of the vocabulary. Um, there's the mathematical statisticians and there's the more machine learning, computer science kind of things, and so there's just vocabulary chaos. And you shouldn't underestimate how difficult that makes things when you're trying to look online. In fact, I believe that contributes to a lot of the chaos in the online material. Um, so down at the bottom, the x value. I think of those x values. These are the things that you use to predict the y value. Now, this, um, what do you notice about the x values here? That one of the things that makes neural networks powerful and advantage of them is that they can deal apparently with what type of x data. Yeah, anything. Uh, you notice we've got an integer type, we've got a real type, and we've got a categorical type, the sex, and so forth. So it can natively handle these types very gracefully, whereas other techniques cannot. Now, it turns out that there are really three kinds of neural networks. This is what I consider the most basic kind. It's called a classifier. The goal is to predict the class, in this case, Democrat, Republican, Independent, slash all others. Um, if the goal is to predict something numeric, for instance, would it be possible to take the same data and predict income from the other variables? Yeah, sure, why not? It's kind of arbitrary. When you're trying to predict something that's numeric, it's called regression, and I'm sure you've heard that term, you know, linear regression and logistic regression. So here, you know, it's back to the vocabulary. And furthermore, there's, um, if we were trying to predict sex from the others, it would, it's called binary classification, and you've got to sort of clearly distinguish between these things. Now, our goal here is we have some data that, that's labeled training data, and that means that this is what's called a supervised technique. Supervised technique just means you've got some data with known correct solutions, okay, in some sense, actual data. There's uh, other techniques called unsupervised training, and that's a, a different topic. <laughs> Okay, so I'm pressing the button on my laptop, which is, and nothing's happening. I should go to the demo machine. There we go. So what is a neural network? Um, now, I guarantee you that most of you have probably seen that white picture, the, the box with the green nodes and uh, orange lines. Because that, you know, a neural network in some ways simulates synapses and neurons in the brain. But that's really only part of it. So let's see if we can see what's going on. Our goal was to, uh, let's see, going back to the previous slide, if you go down to the bottom, we have some incomplete data. And we're trying to predict, okay, if we have someone who is 38 years old with an income of $51,000, who is male and who is Presbyterian, what is their uh, political affiliation? So this slide sort of continues that. Now, going, reading from left to right, you can see that the leftmost column of information is pretty clearly the raw data. Okay? Um, as this presentation goes on, my claim is that to implement, as a developer, to implement a neural network uh, using Visual Studio, you have to understand seven things. Okay, seven things. And one of the seven things is indicated by the second column. Can you infer what's going on there? It should be fairly obvious. What, uh, this, well, I'm talking about the 3.8, the 5.1, and the that. So what's happening? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I heard several people say normalizing or encoding. There's many different terms that say this. Now, surprisingly, I've got to tell you this, like, I'm a mathematician. My PhD is in mathematics. And when I read all the neural network stuff, they totally gloss over this because it's just not cool. But when you have to actually implement a neural network, the normalization process is absolutely critical and annoyingly, it's just annoying. You know, we all code all the time, and some things are just annoying to do. 
but you have to do them. Data encoding or normalization. What we're doing here, the numeric data, absolute, well, theoretically, they don't. Theoretically, you can, and see, that's why the theoreticians, all the theoretical papers say, oh, you don't really have to normalize your data. Well, theoretically, you don't, but if you actually want it to work, you do need some kind of <laughs> normalization. So we talk about that, and so the age, basically, you, you get the problem. Can anyone see what the problem is? Why, what would happen if you don't normalize numeric data? So we've got an age which is 38 and an income which is $51,000. Just common sense tells you these are apples and oranges. You know, I mean, like uh, the, the, the large value. See, the computer doesn't know that income is income. It just knows it's a larger number. So it just, just makes things much more difficult. Now, the other part is slightly more difficult, and I'll say that I have yet to see a very 100% a clear definition of this, is encoding categorical data. So the sex, the male, uh, uh, gets encoded to minus one. Now, that's probably not what would have been your first guess as a software developer, right? How would you, do, how would you be inclined to do male, female? Zero and one, because binary is part of our DNA, or, you know, our you know, mental way. Well, it turns out that that's a big mistake. Um, again, theoretically it works. So all the theoretical papers say, well, theoretically it doesn't matter. But again, if you want to work, this is a form of something called effects encoding. But basically, I mean, it's real simple. If you've got something that can take on two values, make it minus one or plus one. End of story. Okay? But people don't really like to call that out because that's not, because it can't put a bunch of Greek letters next to that in an equation. <laughs> now, the religion thing is called, um, this is called effects encoding, and it turns out that the Presbyterian goes to 0, 1, 0. In other words, you, be, what, why 0, 1, 0? Does anyone remember what the data looks like? Why does Presbyterian go to 0, 1, 0? Why not 0, 1 or 0, 1, 0, 0? You get three categories, 0, one. Yeah, someone called out, there are three categories. So there's going to be one sort of value for each of the possible categories. Now, you would expect one of the categories to be 0, 0, 0. But in fact, that would be, again, probably a mistake. It should be minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. But the point is, you know, this is not going to be a 30-minute lecture on data normalization and coding. One of the things that you must understand for it to work properly is how to normalize and encode data, even though everything that you will read says, well, it doesn't really matter, because that's in theory. So anyway, once we normalize and encode our data, then it gets fed into the actual neural network, which you can think of as just a black box. It's a complicated function. Now, notice the orange lines. Those orange lines, each orange line represents a constant that has to be determined. The orange lines map to a constant, and that's what gives the function its value. So, you can see that the number of orange lines is going to dramatically increase. Now, the first sort of column is the number of input nodes. The, the zeros are called nodes or neurons. Now, the hidden nodes, um, those are the computation nodes. And I'll cut to the chase here and say one of the other seven things that you've got to figure out is, well, how many um, hidden nodes do I have in the diagram? Now, does everyone see five hidden nodes in the diagram? Why five? Where does that come from? Well, we understand the, uh, the, the six, the first six, because that comes directly from the inputs. You have no choice of that. And what about the outputs? Three nodes there. Why three nodes? We're trying to predict political affiliation, which was uh, Democrat, Republican, or independent slash other. Okay, so those are determined by the, the problem, so you don't have to worry about that. But the number of so-called hidden nodes is probably one of the unsolved problems in neural networks. And basically, you just got to try different numbers of hidden nodes, and you, you would expect, what, what, what's, what would a good strategy be? And I'll tell you this, that the more hidden nodes you have, the more flexible and adaptable your neural network becomes. So you would say, okay, well, in that case, I will just make lots of nodes, yes? But it turns out that leads to a, a, another one of the sum problems called overfitting that we'll get to. So anyway, it's hard. And it's basically trial and error, as I'll explain. Now, anyway, so we feed. So, now, if you look at this, neural networks become very easy. It's a numeric input and output. So we feed in 3.8, 5.1, and so forth. And we get out. Now, can anybody interpret what the output means? 
My claim is that that means Democrat. Why? 0 0.43, 0 0.2, and 0.37. Look at the numbers carefully in their relationship. Okay, so as several people observe, yes, the highest value. If the first box, the, the one with the 0.3, represents Democrat, Republican, and other, then it's called, that's called winner takes all. The one with the highest value. But what is the relationship with these values? They, correct. Several people, they do sum to one. This is called soft max activation. And it's just sort of a trick in a way where you trick the outputs to summing to one, but in a proportion so that you can interpret them as probabilities. So in other words, we can interpret this that there is a 0.43 probability roughly. I was going to say, if my research colleagues heard me say that, they would like be flipping out of their chair because that would be theoretically incorrect. But again, the goal of this thing is to show you how to make something that works. Okay? So... <laughs> Pretend it's a probability. Okay, in this case, that would be uh, democratic. Now, there's like a minor detail here before I go on. I, it's because I was just uh, working on something here. What if it came out like 0.43, or how about this, 0 0.48, 0 0.48, and point, whatever is left, 0 0.4, 0 0.04. 0 0.48, 0 0.48, 0 0.04. Do you see how you got to be, you go, wait a minute here, that's really kind of a toss of the coin, or, or better yet, 0 0.50, 0 0.49, 0 0.01. You know, you go, well, you know, I don't really have a confidence here. And we'll get back to that in a second about, you know, what, why that's significant. Okay, now, another one of the, the challenges is if you start looking online for neural network stuff, you're going to be immediately bombarded by, oh, by the way, I'll tell you, you know, okay, if you are faced with learning something new, you go online, what is the first reference you go to every time? Who said Google? <laughs> Security remove that three quarters of the room. No, sorry. <laughs> no, the, the, okay, so you go to the search engine and it will lead you to Wikipedia, correct. And I'll have to say that I, I'm a big, a huge fan of Wikipedia for most things mathematical, but Wikipedia is very weak, very, very weak when it comes to neural networks. So you can get started there, but use it with a, a grain of sand. But one of the things you'll quickly uh, see is that you, you run into this thing called a perceptron, okay, perceptron. And you're going to read about this and that, and you're going to go, you, you'll, you'll be confused for days going, wait a minute, I, I, why am I, I'm searching on neural network, why am I ending up on perceptrons and what's the difference? Okay, it's easy. The perceptron is the circle. End of story. Okay, and you can read more about it, but it's, it's the basic processing unit. And here I'm going to go into a little bit of detail, this one particular slide. I don't think that you'll remember this because uh, hopefully one of the goals of this class is to give you concrete information instead of a hand-waving thing so that you can repeat this, you know, look at it again um, online. But here's how the processing works. So imagine that we've got from left to right three input nodes that have values 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And you can go, well, what do those represent? I don't know, you know, I mean, some, some kind of normalized or encoded data of some kind. And then the weights, W0, W1, W2, Remember I said each orange line in the, the earlier slide represented a weight. So you can imagine that there's a numeric constant next to it. And then all these nodes feed into each other. So the question mark is like, okay, what is the value of that one uh, node? Well, you just, it's pretty easy. Step A up there, you just take each input and multiply it by the associated weight and then sum it up. I mean, is that, yeah, I don't know how else to say it. Um, and then you get that intermediate 1.2. Then in step B, what's going on in step B? And I'll tell you, it looks obvious, but this, this is probably the single biggest pitfall for beginners to neural networks is step B. And I'll explain in a second. So somebody tell me what's happening in step B. I mean, and I'm not trying to be fancy here. Yeah, we're adding 2.0, okay? That's what's going on. And that 2.0 comes from the B, see the B in the image? That's called the bias, okay? Now, in my technical note, I'm, I'm switching down to the technical note. This drove me absolutely crazy for the longest time and still does drive me crazy when I'm doing research. It turns out that the bias is a, con just think of it as a constant. So we've got, you know, 
uh, 0.1 times 4 plus 0.2 times minus 0.5, dot, 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 dot. Then at the very end, plus the constant. You know, we deal with constants all the time. Okay, so it's a constant. But in research literature, they go, ooh, that's just ugly. It, it, it like wrecks the pattern. And so virtually every research paper considers the bias, that 2.0, as, let's see, I got to get it right because I don't do it. So it says it's a weight. So that 2.0 is an extra weight, but there's a dummy input value. A dummy, imagine another white circle up on top that has value 1.0. So if you follow the pattern 1.0 times 2.0, you, you end up with the same thing. So whether or not the bias is explicit and this dummy input just will absolutely drive you crazy. And you got to, and there's no way around it. You just got to read very carefully because all of the, see the vast majority of research is all based on um, mathematicians stuff. Mathematicians have been analyzing this stuff and they hate that extra constant because it makes their equations really bad. But when you're actually implementing these things, it's a hundred times easier just to have the bias as a bias. Okay, so I, I, I just dove into a lot of details, but trust me, don't ignore the bias issue. It's a big deal when you're trying to learn. Anyway, so we add the bias. Then step C is a so-called activation function, where we take some function, which I'll describe in the next slide, and apply it to the 3.2 intermediate value, and that produces the final output. Activations uh, functions have different names, too. Sometimes they're called transfer functions. Um, now, imagine that there was no step C. If there is no step C, what do we have? It's, it's algebra. You see, I mean, just you're just multiplying and adding. Without step C, the activation is the secret sauce. This is the third, I think, of the seven things that you have to understand to implement a neural network. Okay, so here's the activation functions. And again, see, here's I remember distinctly when I was first uh, learning neural networks, where it, it was like peeling away the, the, the onion, I'm not sure if that's the right term, where every time I thought I finally got it, I'd go in and go, oh, man, there's, okay, and one more thing to learn. Well, and activation functions are one of those things, because in all the research you'll read, just like the bias thing, they will assume the logistic sigmoid. Okay, that's sort of like the default. But in fact, it's not even the best one. I don't know, can anybody think of an example where one of the earliest people to do this used the logistic sigma, which I haven't even explained what it is yet, but they used it and everybody else has been using it ever since, even though it's been really proven that it's not the best one to use. You know what I'm getting at? It just sort of caught on and everybody uses it, okay? So anyway. All of these activation functions are called nonlinear, and they allow something remarkable. Now, the, they all have a basic S-shaped curve, more or less, and I'll just leave it at that and say that the activation functions are important. There are four that you need to know about, these four, and um, by understanding those, you have to figure out which one to use. And I do have uh, an article that I can point you to that explains for what particular kind of problem, what kind of activation function do you use. That's one of the things you've got to figure out. Notice uh, if you go all the way down the bottom, remember I mentioned softmax earlier? I mentioned softmax because that somehow generates output where they all sum to one, so they can be interpreted as probabilities. Okay, now, I put this in because I think this is maybe a vanity thing for me. I don't know if it's vanity or not, but whenever I am sitting on that side of the audience and I'm learning about something new or relatively new, I want to know what the alternatives are. You know, So many times, in fact, have you ever found yourself coding? You're supposed to say yes. Um, have you ever found yourself coding and there are some times where you know for sure you're doing it the most efficient, correct way? because you've investigated that kind of problem in the past or whatever, but there are other times where you're doing it and you get your code works, but you're not sure. You, you're thinking maybe there's some entirely different way that I'm not even aware of, it's some alternative approach. Okay, so I always like to know alternatives. Well, there are six main alternatives to a neural network, 
and we'll probably leave it at that. They are, well, I guess I won't leave it at that. Linear regression, logistic regression, naive bays, decision trees, adaptive boosting, and support vector machines. Now, I guess the, the message is there are alternatives, but my message is that there has been a huge increase in interest in neural networks. In some ways, we're in the third phase of neural networks. They originally became very popular. Well, the, there's been several waves. But one of the things now is called deep learning. Has anyone even heard that term? A couple people. Deep learning is the hot thing right now. And basically, it's a neural network where, um, on the earlier slide with all the orange arrows, you know, the nodes and the arrows, uh, deep learning, all that means, does anyone know? It's, it boils down to something real simple. You've got arrows that, Oh, okay, um, one comment was an extra hidden layer. That is true, that's one variation where you just have an extra hidden layer which dramatically increases the complexity. Uh, he said something that makes him look smarter than me, so I'm going to ignore him. Uh, <laughs> he was absolutely correct, though. But I'll put it in words that I can understand, and that is there's a feedback. The um, output from one node feeds back into the others. Okay, but anyway. My claim is that neural networks have advantages over most of the alternatives. But like anything else, people can get religious about their preferred technique, especially support vector machines. There are people that are support vector machine zealots, and they think that it will solve everything, including world peace and world hunger. Um, I disagree. So there are alternatives. Um, and sort of related to this, this was originally one slide, but then I broke it down to two, so don't, you know, I'm, I'm fearful that somebody's going to go back and re-watch this thing, or somebody's right now counting the number of slides, and go, oh, you, dude, you lied, there's like 12 slides. This used to be one slide, um, and the next one. Um, now here's this pro up top, this is something that, that is practically not important, but it's kind of near. And one of the pros of neural networks is that it is theoretically provable that neural networks, as I've described them, are so called universal function approximations. In other words, that means they can, in theory, oh, there's that in theory again, solve any kind of problem. They can model any kind of crazy math equation. And that you know, gives them their power. So that's always been true. Um, Another pro, the, the second one there is multinomial output. That's the example like I showed you earlier of, uh, of the, uh, the one we're trying to predict political affiliation. That's multinomial because there's more than two possible results. A surprising number of these techniques can only handle bi you know, binary output without, anyway, you can sort of see that neural networks handle the multinomial case uh, sort of like without resorting to any kind of crazy tricks. Now, there are um, negatives to neural networks. Um, requires lots of training data, okay? There is, a, I'll mention this, I didn't put it in my slide because I, I want to, there is a cousin to neural network called radial basis functions. Maybe one of the worst names ever. See, when you hear neural network, right, it conjures up in your head, oh, sort of based on neurons and synapses. What comes to mind if you don't know already? Radial basis function. Nothing, okay. <laughs> you know, doesn't mean anything to me. Well, anyway, they're a cousin to neural networks that can, in theory, handle uh, small uh, uh, training uh, sets. But, you know, I mean, especially with the cloud and everything, you know, another reason why neural networks are becoming uh, uh, far is sort of this new level of interest is because we're harvesting so much data and don't really have good ways to uh, analyze it. Um, con. Okay, so the con, notice it's one con, it's really multiple cons, and these cons are really the seven topics that I said that you really have to understand. You've got to figure out the number of hidden nodes, and basically it's trial and error, okay? Um, activation functions, you have to understand them, when to use which particular one. Input, output, encoding, we talked about that, you know, that little pitfall of uh, male, female should go minus one, plus one. Um, error definition, now the error definition is built in. So when you're doing trial and error, you figure out, well, it's, it's pretty simple. How good does the neural network predict our training data? Okay. 
But it's, not so, it's, it's surprisingly tricky to figure out what error means, and there's something called uh, mean squared error, but there's something called cross entropy error that is um, important. Um, now, con. It's really, I don't know, I just put it on another line. I don't know why. Um, you've got to pick a particular training method. Now, training is going to be the next slide, and the training process is figuring out those constants represented by all the orange lines. How do you figure those out? Basically, training is figuring out the constants that produce the neural network that best match the input data to the training output. Um, the training-free parameters. It turns out that there are three primary training ways, techniques, and all of them have free parameters. And a free parameter in machine learning just means something that you've got to guess at and figure out through trial and error. Will be more expensive. So in other words, there's a lot of trial and error. And a overfitting defense strategy, which I'll explain uh, coming up shortly. OK, so here's the training. As I just mentioned, the, uh, the training algorithm is how you determine this. Now, have, uh, raise your hand if you've heard of back propagation. Okay. That is about a third to a half of the room. Now, I guarantee you that if you're new to neural networks, the second thing you're going to see, the first thing you're going to see is the picture with the, the circles and all the, the lines connecting. The second thing you're going to start reading about is backpropagation. So much so, backpropagation was a technique that had been around for a while, but it was sort of rediscovered somewhere in the 1980s. And it is a training technique that is mathematically beautiful. So, in a room full of developers, what do you think when you hear it's mathematically beautiful? Yeah, it doesn't work, OK? Uh, it's, see, I work in the world of research. And presumably, I don't know what your world is like, but I'm guessing that how are you evaluated by the quality of the code you produce and the work that you produce, right? Everybody does, to some extent. In research, researchers are evaluated by, in part, by how many research papers they spit out, OK? And if you can't prove something with Greek letters, you can't spit out a research paper. Backpropagation is a treasure trove of Greek letters, OK? <laughs> and it is mathematically elegant and beautiful. Um, but my message here is that it, unless you read carefully, you, c you will easily be led to believe that backpropagation is the only training technique there is. It is the default. In fact, I have never, I've been unable to find a single reputable implementation of anything other than backpropagation. And by the way, uh, as part of the, the, the study I did, so I looked at, I, I, I gathered every example of backpropagation I could find um, with certain restrictions, uh, languages in Java, C++, and so forth like that. I did not find one single one that did not have at least one serious bug in it. Okay, so be careful. But I'm going to show you, by the way, I am going to give you guaranteed bug-free code. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. I wrote it myself. Um, but anyway, okay, back to back propagation. Back propagation is one of many techniques used to determine the magic numbers, okay, that train the network. And when I do the demo, you know, I don't know about you. See, if I was sitting here, I'd be kind of going, oh, okay, the guy's kind of funny and kind of interesting. I'm getting some information. But it all boils down to show me the code, you know, show me the application. That's coming up soon. Um, now, the, uh, I'll switch down to the bottom one. It's called particle swarm optima optimization. Particle swarm optimization is something you may or may not have heard of, but it's a completely different kind of approach that is based on the behavior of the, the grouping behavior of things like flocks of birds and schools of fish and things like that. Um, and it turns out that there's some research to su suggest that it is stunningly effective for training neural networks very unexplored. You can find some research papers on it, but you won't find that any of this has really made it into the hands of the developer community yet. And I actually do have one. In fact, I will give you a link to an example of that, but it's not you know, totally solved, but it'll give you a good idea. Now, there's a, a third technique called genetic algorithms, 
that were formerly quite popular, um, they, they seem to have fallen out of favor. However, let, let's summarize. All three of these are techniques to train the neural network, and the problem with all three of them is they require free parameters. You have to supply, you, as the person running your code or using the tool, have to supply some number, and it turns out that, especially for back propagation, well, we'll show it, is whether or not the thing works at all is ultra sensitive to your choice of free parameter values. You know, you try something and nothing works, you try something else and you get beautiful results. I will say particle swarm optimization tends to be less sensitive uh, than this other one, which is one of the main reasons, than back propagation. Uh, this will become more clear when I do the demo, I hope. Okay, now, model overfitting. This was the last of the seven topics that I said that you had to sort of grasp in order to become, by the way, part of the survey I did, we tried to estimate how many developers there were in the world that had the knowledge and skill to implement a neural network. So obviously there was a lot of guesswork, okay, and this was three years ago. Everybody follow what I'm getting at? You know, like we, we want to, how many people can actually do this correctly? What do you think we guess? Does anyone want to toss out an order magnitude number? Three years ago, how many developers roughly could correctly and successfully implement an accurate neural network? Thousand? Only me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, the best number we came with, there's a pretty good answer there. Um, the best number we could come up with was somewhere in the neighborhood of probably under 100, you know? And that was pretty much guesswork, of course. Mostly because there was, I mean, it's, it's obviously clearly not, I'll bet you that, I'm, a, you know, I'll, how to say this? You know, I'm not trying to boast. I'm a good developer. I'm really good. But I'll, be, but I'll bet, you know, you have to, you know, be honest about that. I'll say that, I'll bet you that, Many people, maybe half the people in this room, are better developers than I am, okay? So it's not your developer ability that would be the, the, the problem. It's the lack of useful information available on the Internet. So you go out and you get this wrong information. You'd have to spend the time to figure out the correct way. And then how we did our estimate is, and then somehow post on your personal blog or something like that to let us know that you figured out uh, what was wrong. But anyway... I don't know how I got on this, but we're talking about now model overfitting, one of the seven things that you have to understand in order to correctly be one of the group. I mean, literally, this room could conceivably, if every one of you followed up on this for some reason, it could double the number, potentially double the number of, <laughs> I mean, it sounds weird, but potentially, or potentially I'm, yeah, yeah on something else, <laughs> Greek letters. Um, so model overfitting. Model overfitting I consider to be the biggest practical challenge uh, once you get over the nuts and bolts of where the semicolons go and how to design your arrays. And basically, the, the roulette example uh, is, is kind of correct and kind of not. So imagine you've got this sequence. <laughs> I love going to conferences in Vegas because I'll be sitting there watching the wheel. I will. Red, red, black. Red, red, black. Red, red, black red, red, boom. Now, if that was your data, if that was your training data, you could train a neural network, and it would predict with 100% confidence that the next result is going to be black, because it found the pattern. By the way, this is, as an aside, this is really a variation called a time series analysis, where things are unfolding over time. Neural networks can solve those, but you get the idea. That if you have limited data or you have too much data, if you train the network enough because of the theoretical implication that a neural network can fit any exotic model, that I, literally, I could give, in fact, it would be kind of fun to do sometime. I could give you a piece of paper or a, a touch device and ask you to draw any kind of squiggly line that went from left to right, no, you know, up, down, as long as it didn't do anything totally like a spiral. And we could fit a neural network that would match your pattern exactly, okay? But the problem is, that's overfitting. You fit the training pattern too perfectly, and then when new data comes along, which is really what you're interested in, um, it doesn't fit at all. 
so there are five techniques for dealing with uh, overfitting. Uh, one of them is lots of training data. Uh, and then these other things, um, which I'll say are outside the scope of this talk, but they are in the demo. Uh, so when you look at the code, yeah, like I said, show me the code. When you look at the code, you'll be able to see it. OK, now, uh, before we get, we're on the verge of the demo, which is really the last. OK, so where we're at now is I'm going to show you a couple slides, and I'm going to run through the demo, and then that will wrap us up. Um, but it turns out for part of your educational process, the most well-known and common existing tool with the UI is called, it, does anybody from New Zealand or Australia here? How would you pronounce it, sir? I can't repeat it. I mean, because he did it right. We say Weka, okay, but it's some kind of a New Zealand bird or something like that. I think it's kind of like Weka, but it doesn't matter, Weka. This is a tool um, that has a UI. And it's the most well-known one. It was implemented in Java. Um, <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, but it's the, I'd say, the more or less the industry standard. But it has massive weaknesses, as we'll see. Now, look up at the top. What's one thing that you notice right up, uh, not, not to be mad to it, but look up near the top. This, my claim is this is a neural network. What do you see up there? No. <laughs> no. No. You see, the, it says multi-layer perceptron. You go, wait, see, that's part of the, the nomenclature of the naming problem. Um, and then if you look into the outside, you see sigmoid node, and this and that and the next thing. So my claim is that even if you use an existing tool with a nice UI, you can't use them effectively unless you understand those seven topics. You've got to know. Why am I using sigmoid? Why am I not using hyperbolic tangent or something like that? Um, now, this is just an example of internally at Microsoft Research, we have our own kind of version of Weka, and it's called TLC. So this is not anything that you would find. I think it, there's some mentions of it on blog posts. And basically, if you look at it, my, my message is, it, you know, it's a, it's a GUI. You know, if, if, you, if I matched up the picture side by side, you'd see, oh, there's the same kind of information there. Um, and it talks about things like, oh, there's one interesting. Can you see, oh gosh, I don't even know how to describe it, but there's like two, two images of it. And on the left-hand one, left-hand image that's upper, then on the right-hand side, the right-hand column, near the middle of the top thing, it says loss function, cross entropy. Remember I said that surprisingly, determining, you know, dealing with error is a surprisingly tricky thing. And that's one of the seven things you have to know. So in this case, we're using cross entropy. There you go. Why? OK. Well, you have to understand that. OK. Now, oh, and the, um, the tool I just showed you has an API set. Now, here's my claim. This topic, or the title of this presentation is Implementing Neural Networks Using Visual Studio. So the idea is that, well, wait a minute. Why should I go this work? Because it is a significant amount of work. When tools like Weka and others exist, and API, there's open source. You can find open source API sets. Now, this is something that you're all faced with at some point or another, I, I believe. And that is basically, do I code it from scratch myself? Or in the case of an API set, do I just, well, who can tell me, why don't we just use the API set, like this one? I mean, you can find something that's very close to this. Why don't you just use this? Exactly. A little bit louder. Yeah, so I understand it. My, my claim is, how often have you like, taken weeks and weeks to learn somebody's stupid API set that is like poorly documented, and then when you're finally done, you don't even, not even sure what's going on, and you can't modify it in the first place. Now, there's pros and cons. If it's a one-shot deal, if you're going to do one neural network in your life, then you would probably be best to go this route. But if you're going to do more than one, I claim, in many cases, it's worth thinking about implementing it yourself from scratch. Now, prior to this talk, that wasn't really feasible, but I'm going to give you the resources you need to, to at least have a chance at doing it, I think, I hope. OK, so the Visual Studio, so that's sort of like the, the last part of that thing is, you know, you can implement this in Visual Studio. Neural networks are not magic. And here's a demo of the so-called famous iris problem. And this is uh, sort of the, so the demo, so where we're at now, the, this demo should take maybe five to six minutes or so. You know, and I'll just, basically, it's, <laughs> I feel so bad. 
as a developer. You know, did anyone, I, I was watching uh, parts of some of the presentations online, and they just have beautiful graphics, you know, and did anyone see that thing? Um, I don't know, it was, it was some, like they made their own game with the, the desert oasis and stuff like that. It just blew me away. How can anybody draw, you know, art like that, you know? For me, like, I'm happy if I change the background color of my shell. You know, that's like, <laughs> that is the state of the art of, like, artistry for me. Um, so you're not going to be overwhelmed by any flashy graphics here. Okay, let's see if I can pull it up. Okay. So basically, this is the demo, and... If you can see the scroll bar, well, here, I'll, I'll do this. So I'll go all the way down to the very bottom of this thing. Now, this is seriously a production class. Even though it's just a demo, it's non-trivial uh, neural network. And if I do the control G, we're at line roughly 900. And of that, probably half of it is comments and white space and stuff like that. So it's not totally trivial. There's about... 400 lines of code here that implement a realistic. So, you know, it, lines of code isn't necessarily a good measure of complexity or anything, but it gives you an idea it's certainly feasible. So here's the demo. I'm just going to run through it here. Notice my, <laughs> I never comment my code, but I knew you guys were going to see it, so I did. <laughs> okay, so here's the demo. So begin the demo. Now, the, the famous Iris data set. Part of your education is there's certain, you know, there's certain things that everybody in the field knows. And one of the things that everybody in neural networks knows is the IRIS data set. Uh, a researcher named Fisher in 1935, I believe, collected some actual data about irises. I didn't even know what an iris was. I thought it was eyeballs. But it's plants, like a flower of some sort. Okay? And I'm not joking, by the way. That wasn't meant to be funny. But he, they measured something called the sepal which luckily Wikipedia was correct on this. The sepal is like the green covering of something, like a bud, kind of. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I, I've given a lot of talks to it. Rarely have I seen people going, okay, trust, <laughs> trust me on this. Okay, it's like the green covering, and then the petal part is like the flower part, okay? So the raw data, which is available many times, there are 150 of these that go back to the 1930s. So, original, so the original problem was, to predict the species of iris flower based on those four numeric values, which were uh, sepal length and width and petal length and width. Got it? So that's the problem. It's very famous. It's kind of like the hello world of machine learning prediction data, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's what the raw data looks like. It's available in many places on the Internet. By the way, uh, the source for all benchmark problems is the University of California, Irvine, has a, a benchmark problem data set. That's the place to go. Okay, now next, what I did was, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I hate demos that have text files where the data is. So I just hard-coded the data into the demo that I'm going to give you a point or two. So you don't have to worry, what happened to the data file? How come I can't read it? Why, the new lines are all messed up because, you know, something like that. Um, but the first... Six rows of the actual data set are there. So what did I do? This, this is the hard-coded in the program. Compare the raw data to this next thing, this first six rows. What happened there? Well, I didn't, no, I did not normalize it, actually. The, the inputs are copied exactly the same. I encoded the output. You see that? I was, like, see the last? Okay, so the first four numbers... 5.1, 3.5, 1.4, and 0.2 of the input. Those are the inputs. Then the th last three, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 1.0, .0, that 0, 0, 001, that means uh, iris versicolor, whatever that. No, I iris setosa. Okay? Everybody get it? So anyway, I encoded it in some way. And that's one of the things you have to understand. Okay, now... Um, what you do is you break your data up into a training and test, where you train it on part of it, 80%, and basically what it does here is just take the 150 item set and scramble them, randomly assigning 80% of it to it. This is called, one of the, it was in one of the things I talked about, it's one of the things you have to learn about, this is called holdout validation, and it's one of several techniques. And this one's the simplest. So we hold out 20% of the data to figure out, you know, d does our neural network work or not? 
Okay, now we normalize it, and you can see that the input data has now been normalized. And I'll just say that normalizing is really, it's annoying but simple. Um, the easiest way is just compute the mean, the average of every column, and then normalize by x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay, but you can details. It's theoretically easy but technically annoying. So we normalize all the data. Okay, now I'm calling my neural network constructor. It's creating a four input, because there's four values to input, seven hidden, that's arbitrary, and you have to do trial and error, um, and three output, because why three outputs? The choices are iris setosa, iris versicolor, and iris virginica. Okay, and initializing weights and biases to small random values. Now, I'm going to use backpropagation here. And one of the things I said a weakness about backpropagation is that it is highly sensitive to the free parameters. One of the free parameters here is the initial weights, small random values. You'd think like, well, is that going to make a difference? It turns out it has a huge effect. It's a weakness of backpropagation. Okay, and boom, that was it. It just trained. What it did was it iterated, and you can see it was very fast because our data set was small, and it found the best set of weights where the inputs match the outputs. Now, you can see that if you read closer to the bottom, max epics. Did I spell that right? Yeah, epics. An epics is just a, a loop counter variable, okay, because it's an iterative process, and that's one of the things you have to say, well, how many times, you know, how often do I do it? Well, here I did a maximum of 2,000 times. Now, the learning rate, the momentum, and the weight decay, those are the free parameters. That is the curse of all neural network training, but especially so with backpropagation. And the answers you get are ultra-sensitive to those values that you supply. So again, in short, neural networks work beautifully if you can give the four correct free parameters. Well, depending on your point of view. One of them is the number of hidden nodes, momentum, learning rate, and so on. Okay, so let's see what we got. So down the bottom of the screen, all those uh, uh, values of three decimals, those are the magic values that are just constants that make the neural network match the output data. Now, down at the bottom, it, it doesn't look very important. So the accuracy on the training data is 0.9833. Is that pretty good? Yeah, 98.33%. You go, that sounds pretty good. I don't know. Seems okay. If I would have let it run another 500 iterations or epics, we would have got 100% accuracy. So why did I do it? See, the point is, that number is pretty irrelevant. The accuracy on the training set, because if you let it run enough, you're going to get 100% accuracy. But you will have overfit your training data. The number that counts is the accuracy on that holdout test set. That is the measure of quality of the neural network, which in this case is 93.33%, which is pretty decent, okay? And what you would do is you would just try different combinations. Sometimes it's called a sweep of number of input nodes, I mean, hidden nodes and learning rate and stuff like that, and you find the one that produces the best accuracy on the test set. That's your measure of quality. Um, then I just add in, um, so the whole point of all that was, you know, I... You know, you have this model, which just means the magic numbers. So I showed how to predict. So down at the bottom, I just picked 4.5, 3.0, 4.5, 1.0 .0 as arbitrary values. What, what would the prediction be? And the predicted output is 0 0.03, 0 0.83, 0 0.14. And because the biggest one is in the middle there, the highest probability, that would be the, one, the species in the middle. You can kind of get the idea. Like, the whole point is to predict. See, the mathematicians just want a beautiful, elegant model. I go, well, it would be nice to actually do something useful with this. Okay. End demo. Okay, now, we're on the home stretch here. Go. So, summary. <laughs> it's not always good news. You go, oh, thank, thank goodness he's done. Um, okay, let's see, y'all. Oh. I was about to do the, the, the worst thing ever. In fact, when I sit down in a presentation, and if the first words that come out of the speaker's mouth is PowerPoint slide, bullet one, he starts reading it word for word, I'm, psh, I'm out of there. You know, I don't need to sit through someone reading to me. But I will do that here because it's too late. You've already sat through me. Um, <laughs> so there are existing neural network tools 
but the existing code available to you is highly, highly flawed. Be exceptionally careful. And tools, you know, basically if you use Weka or something like that, you run all your stuff and basically save the result. Suppose you want to integrate it into a, your own system. You know what you do. You would run the tool somehow through a batch program, save the results as a text file, write another batch file, maybe a Perl script that grabs the output of that. You know, you know what I mean? You end up with you know, bandaged together. So it's very difficult. Now there are existing commercial, so you can buy commercial API libraries. Okay, they're quite pricey and it's hard for me to say, because I've only looked at them and used them without a real careful evaluation, but I have not been impressed by their quality, okay? Um, plus, you run into all kinds of licensing issues and stuff like that. And the open source API libraries, well, you know, I mean, API, they're either great or in between and you don't really know. Um, so, uh, point three there, the, the seven core concepts. Feed forward, that's a, a way to say the, the architecture, you know, how things work. The activation functions. Uh, what they are and when to use them. Data encoding, the error, that cross entropy thing. Training, how do you train it? The free parameters, which are part of the training, and overfitting. Once you understand those concepts, you can sort of join a very select and elite group of people. Um, here's some resources. Um, by far, it's been around forever. By far, for the, the, that first thing, um, is that FTP, it's hosted by SAS, which is a, a company that does statistical software. This is a really old neural network. You can tell just by looking at it that it goes way back to the early, mid-90s. It is by far, by far, the most authoritative source of information on neural networks. I've only found a couple of inaccuracies there. Okay, so if you want the truth, go to there. Um, Weka, I, I just put down a link for that because um, it's, a, it's a very good tool. And then Custom C Sharp is a, um, prior to this talk, that was the single best reference, which was written by a really, really smart guy out of Microsoft Research. Um, <laughs> but, but I now have an update and drum roll PC. See, I was going to, okay, so I, really, I didn't realize that this was going to be recorded until now, but here is... Two things. First of all, notice how I harnessed my PowerPoint skills and did the animation there. I was deeply impressed. But I created a special, the complete source code for the demo that I showed you in this presentation is available at that link. Now, it's a sort of this external link because it's own, my own personal blog site. And the only, reason, the only reason I put it there was because I had control over the formatting. You know, when you go through hosted things and you have to copy something, and ugh, it messed up all the indentation stuff. So that's... It's not a download, it's just source code you go, and for me, you know, the thing I like best is when I see a H, plain HTML page and I can copy and paste it in the Visual Studio, and that's what that is. Okay, let's see. Now, the rest of this, I don't know what happened here. That's a thank you. Don't clap yet. I'll, believe me, I'll let you know when it's time to clap. Uh, um, down at the very bottom, I have my uh, information. I've got to say, you know, I've been joking around a lot, but I'm deeply passionate about this. This is what I love to do. And if I didn't want you to send me an email, I wouldn't have put my email address down there. So if you want to send me an email and talk about this, if you have a question, send it. I promise you I'll get you a response. It may not be right away, but I'll respond eventually. And let's see what else we have. Ooh, wow. Okay, get your goodies. They added this in. Six o'clock. Okay, we'll make sure that you get there. Um, evaluate the session again. Like I said early, whether or not there will be additional topics that are kind of, you can see that this was sort of like a forward-looking talk that, you know, it, it wasn't like Windows 8 in the Enterprise or something like that, you know. Um, if you like the content, be sure that you evaluate so, that, so I can come back next year on a free trip to San Francisco. <laughs> oh, uh, Microsoft. I work for Microsoft, okay, uh, apparently. And now, now you can applaud. <laughs> Okay, that concludes the talk, so if you want to, you know, feel free. And by the way, don't try to all, I, I noticed the, the last talk, they're all funneling through there like rats in their little thing, you know, there's actually other doors, you know. So you can leave right away and we'll have question and answer, and I'll stick around um, uh, for a while until we get tired of answering questions. Yes, we have a question here?
Microsoft takes on things like deep learning and take it to prime time and put it in, in Azure or something like that. I mean, given how seemingly, and I'm really not an expert at all, but seemingly incredibly impressive it is, you know, why not? Okay, so the question was, um, how come, why does Microsoft not take some of the information that I presented here or deep learning and actually put it into products like perhaps SQL Server, Excel, or maybe even expose an API set to developers, which is what I'd like to see. Well, you know, I don't know exactly. I have a couple hunches. One of my hunches is, and this is a little, I, gosh, I hope we're not being recorded still, but um, I, you know, the, this stuff is not easy. It's really, really difficult, and the developers that I've run into at Microsoft are among the world's best, but they're a very niche kind of thing, and how I mentioned there's a gap between the mathematical knowledge. I have a PhD in math, and I was able to figure this stuff out. I can read the Greek letters and get it, but most developers can't. So my hunch is that this gap exists, and that's one reason why it's not making the tools. Now, I do know that Microsoft does have some initiatives to, to do exactly what you've suggested, but I don't really know the details. So that's kind of a, the best answer I can get. Yes, you have a question here? I'm sorry, was it? Did I use it? Did you use a neural network to predict how many neural network developers there were? Okay, so the recursive question was, did I use a neural network to predict how many developers there were that used neural networks? You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> no, actually I did not. It was just pure guesswork. But that's the kind of thing, actually, I hadn't thought about it, to tell you the truth, but that's the kind of thing that neural networks are quite good at. It, anytime... Anytime you boil down, to, I, I'll tell you, I used a neural network to predict the outcome of the Super Bowl. I do it every year. To me, that's a lot of fun. And quite profitable, too, over the last five years. Okay? But that's another story. <laughs> yes? If you need to do binary, would you consider a neural network or some other program? The question was a very good one. Suppose you are going to do binary classification. That is, the result is either this or that, male or female, or, in the case of a stock market, buy or sell, or something like that. These binary questions, so the question was, if you have such a problem, do I consider using a neural network, or do I consider using many of the other existing techniques that are dedicated specifically for those types of problems? Most well-known are naive Bayes, um, and logistic regression. Now, here's where, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Even though neural networks have been around for a long time, I was in a very long, the short answer is, I use neural networks for these types of problems, but I am in the minority. My colleagues at Microsoft Research, and these guys are super bright guys, most of them smarter than me, say I'm wrong. But there's a few times, usually when guys who are smarter than me say I'm wrong, I believe them, but there's one time where I think they're wrong. Um, I believe that neural networks are the best all-purpose. Neural networks, when used with particle swarm optimization, not backpropagation. See, they're all using, they do stuff and they use the canned sigmoid backpropagation. I do things totally differently, and I think neural networks are better. So a long answer to a short question. Yes? So the question is, is there a shortcut to doing the sweep? Um, the answer is not really. Um, what we found is that machine hardware and, you know, sort of behind-the-scenes parallelization has really helped. Things that were just not feasible 10 years ago, like the, the demo I ran now, 10 years ago was a very challenging problem, the 150 data set. It would, it would have clunked along for a minute or two. But now machines are so blazingly fast. So the answer is... It's, it's an area that hasn't really been studied that much, but basically neural network problems fall into the category of, you know, for sweeps, you just sweep, and either they're feasible, by that I mean maybe run in a few hours or a day, or completely unfeasible, because the time extends exponentially, and you reach a certain point where if it's not going to run in a day, it's not going to run in 100 years kind of thing. Yes? Amazing. Uh, so, a very clever question. So, the curse of neural networks is figuring out the values of the free parameters, which is a prediction problem. 
predict the values of the free parameters to make the neural. So in other words, could you use a neural network on that? But then, yes, you could, but then what's the problem? Then you have to find the free parameters of that neural network. However, um, it turns out that sort of the state of the art is to use something called a genetic algorithm, which you've probably heard of, which is very or much less sensitive to the free parameters, use a genetic algorithm to figure out the values of the free parameters of the neural network to solve the problem at hand. And that's sort of state of the art right now. Yes? Another very good question. So imagine, the question was, a lot of times, you know, just because you have a correlation doesn't mean there's necessarily a cause and effect. So how do we deal with this and can we, like, do some preliminary processing? Imagine the question that I had here. We're trying to predict political party affiliation, okay? Can I, you know, you can imagine that there's some other feature there that would be completely irrelevant. I mean, I think sex and income would tend to be correlated to political party affiliation. In fact, these are well known. Um, uh, but um, you can imagine some, like color of hair, or shoe size, you know? Every, everything I come out, I can think of some back there. But anyway, so what do you do here? So it is possible to pre-process, and it's called, that's called feature selection. It's a sub-area where you go through and do some pre-processing and find out, like this doesn't even correlate at all. But you've got to be very careful. Because feature selection, imagine that you went through and found out, for instance, that sex did not correlate at all with political party affiliation. However, behind the scenes, sex combined with income is highly relevant. So feature selection is very tricky. Um, there's no easy answer to that other than you just have to use a lot of common sense Oh, and this is a good thing. Well, I, one of the things I forgot to say in my talk was, suppose there was this awesome, suppose Weka worked really good all the time. Well, then I wouldn't be giving this talk because then anybody could do it. You know what I mean? You just like run through and Weka would always work. You have to, my view is that you have to be very careful and think about these things and customize your code and think very carefully about things like those long periods. So sorry, kind of a long question, but a very good one and one that I didn't bring up. Yes, here? His observation was that he'd read recently about sort of speculation about how the human brain works. And in fact, it has sort of made its way where there's been, the connection is, so the basic connection is the neural network sort of models roughly how it's thought that neurons and synapses work. But deep learning, which we talked about earlier, is modeling sort of recent advances in how people actually uh, perform cognition and stuff like that. So yes, it has made its way into the neural network kind of field by way of deep learning. Yes? So you mentioned that a lot of the toolkits and APIs that you examined had some serious flaws in them. Do you re recommend any specific techniques for testing neural network implementations and separating logical errors from, say, the improper choice of free parameters? You know, so the question was, I observed that the, uh, the API sets that I found all had, I went, you know, I think I said something politically correct like flaws. There's flat out bugs, including even bugs in our own internal code. And the only, the question was, did I have any good way of detecting these? The answer is no, I didn't. I'm, one of my strengths and weaknesses at the same time is like it drives me crazy when there's some code and I don't understand it completely. So that means I end up you know, spending a lot of wasted time going down dead ends. And the only way I was able to find these bugs is I'd be looking at code, and I'd go, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. And I would re, you know, I'd implement my version and compare. It was a very slow and painful process until I finally found out, whoa, wait a minute, that's just plain wrong. You know? 
So the short answer is no. It was a very long and tedious process. Just as a quick aside, uh, would you think that techniques like unit testing of the perceptron itself would be a good way to weed out these bugs, or were most of the ones that you encountered much more subtle? So the question was, would you know, techniques like unit testing, I'm a big believer in testing, catch these things or others? The answer is no. Most of the bugs I found were directly traceable back to, obviously, the developer who wrote the code was writing the code based on incorrect information found on the internet. The logic was wrong. And it, so it worked, you know, I mean, it didn't like blow up, and it was running, but it was just wrong, you know, because like they were doing you know, something based on, there's a lot of myths about neural networks. Like, you can read, like how many hidden nodes there should be. Well, it should be the number of training test cases times the number of output nodes times the square root of two. No, no, it, the, these things are just myths. Anything else? One last, okay, wait, two last questions. Here and here, so we'll go here first, yes? Okay. Suppose a newbie had a neural net implementation in place already, but wanted to start conducting experiments to find an optimal neural net architecture. Um, there's just so many things to look out for, learning rate, momentum, number of nodes in the hidden layer, layer, number of hidden layers. Where would one even begin? What are some things that you should start looking out for? So the question here is, and I'll, I'm going to rephrase the question, because the question that you had is exactly what I was feeling. It's like, how do I get traction in this area? Because I was starting from scratch like everybody else. I was very cynical, and I first believed, oh, I could just find a lot of existing code. But then I ran into, remember I described the onion, you know, every time I thought I figured it out, then there was oh, yet another issue, yet another issue. My answer is that there are a finite number of issues, that they'll reach a certain point where all of a sudden, you know, I had an epiphany, I go, wow, I, I, I get it. You know, I'm actually now confident. So the answer is it's part of the learning process, and one of the reasons why there are so few people in our estimation, that can, developers, that can actually do this, because you get so discouraged going, ah, I got it, then next, you know, four hours later, oh, no, I don't, okay? Then three days later, I got it, oh, no, I don't. But it does eventually end with the topics that I've described here. You know, and I, I, I'm not trying to be boastful, but I've identified every core important topic, and once you master these topics, you've got it, so there's no shortcuts. And last question. Interesting. So the question was this, a very interesting one, that I mentioned, okay, imagine the picture of the, the, the three vertical columns of the neural network, input, hidden, output. And the one of the things I said was you, it's, you trial and error to determine the number of hidden nodes. But even though I didn't explicitly state it, it is possible to have more than one hidden layer, okay? So imagine input, hidden, hidden, output, which would dramatically increase the complexity, and you could try those too. One really good piece of news is that it's called Covers Theorem, proved that anything that can be solved with two hidden layers can be solved with one hidden layer. So you can come, yes, just a different number. So mercifully, that is the one, you know, uh, you know we, I, I was making a lot of fun of the mathematicians, but there are times like that, if it wasn't for that theoretical proof, you'd be going down uh, a, a fruitless track trying to do different architectures with different numbers. So basically, one hidden layer is all you need. That's all, thanks. I hope to see you around. Uh, and enjoy the conference.